So, uh, welcome to the second CBAA CMTO webinar. Uh, the last, this is the uh, second on social media that we've done. The first one, which was heard a month ago, was about social media principles. This one's more specifically focusing on Facebook and what to do uh, with your Facebook presence for uh, if you're a community broadcaster. Uh, assisting with this session today is Kate Vandervoort, who's um, from Social Mediology. She's the uh, founder and CEO. Kate founded Social Mediology in 2009 to, to fill, fulfill her passion of connecting people, organizing, and ideas. She's used social media as a tool for building brands, increasing sales, creating social change, and building online communities. Kate worked on the social media resource that you can find on the CB Online website at cbonline.org.au. Kate's had over 15 years' experience in the not-for-profit sector in the areas of marketing, online strategies, fundraising, business development. Uh, she's been the general manager of the Quest for Life Foundation, chairman of the Good Company, uh, sorry, on the Good Company board, uh, a degree in social work, uh, train, uh, qualifications and training. Um, I'm umming a bit because I'm reading it off screen. <laughs> she's recently participated in the Leadership Australia program, Asia Link Leadership program, the World Youth Leadership program, and the AICD Company Directors course. So Kate has done uh, a lot of work in the social media field, both for large corporate entities, but also the smaller um, fish you want to play in the same field. So I'm just going to hand you over to Kate, and she's going to run the session. At the end At of this, we'll put out a link to a survey, and it'd be great if you could complete it so we could use that feedback to improve the webinars in the future. Over to Kate. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, can I just check that you can see my screen now? I'm not quite sure how it's displaying. Nicola, Stephen, maybe I'll just look in the chat. If, uh, there should be a screen up. Okay. So, Nicola, I'm not sure what's happening around the screen, but it's not showing my screen. Do you need to change me to the presenter? We'll close the poll. I think you're good now. I can see a beautiful PowerPoint that I would never be able to do that says Face Facts, Facebook for Radio. Okay, thanks, Nicola. You can now see my screen, which is great. Um, so I'm also going to press the record button, Nicola, because I can do that from here. So good evening, everyone. Um, it's really lovely to be here with you this evening. I've gone through a lot of the questions that came through in the last webinar uh, that were specifically related to Facebook, and we've got a jam-packed session this evening um, covering all of that. So we'll look at strategy and the team and who might be involved with uh, Facebook, getting the setup of Facebook right. I want to look a bit at the content um, and particularly the creative content mix, so when to post, all of those burning questions that I know that everyone had last time. Um, how you deal with negative feedback online and then we'll definitely leave some room for questions. So feel free to send those through the chat um, as we go. If we could just ask that the questions stay at sort of a Facebook level, it can be really tricky to answer every individual, particularly when we've got so many people online. Um, sometimes there are really specific questions about your uh, station set up. I'm really happy to answer those um, on our Facebook page at another time, um, so feel free to ask those questions. But if we could keep the questions this evening at the sort of larger Facebook level so that it's relevant for everyone, that would be fantastic. Kate, could I just Kate? Sorry, could I just could I just butt in for a minute? I think a few people are having trouble seeing the screen. Um, I'm actually going to put everyone's hands down. I'm going to ask now if you put your hand up if you can't see the screen that has a coffee cup in the top left-hand corner with Facebook. Wow, a lot of people can't see that screen. I'm just going to press stop showing the screen and then press show the screen again and see if that works. Uh. 
I've got it. It looks like people are saying that's better. People can see it. Fantastic. Okay, there's lots coming through the chat, Nicola, that says we've got it. So I'll keep on going. Um, so I just want to cover quickly the structure of Facebook before we get into some of the specifics. So the major benefit for organisations and, and companies, particularly from a marketing perspective, is Timeline, which is the business page. And I will talk a bit about the difference between groups and business pages and personal profiles. Um, but the main structure I'm going to talk about tonight is Timeline for business pages. Facebook gives you the ability to link with other web pages, blogs, photos, etc. It's almost like a mini website and you can connect. It's a great hub to connect all of your social media uh, in one place. You're able to build apps or customise pages that have got calls to action so it can be really specific from a marketing perspective. And some of those apps can do other things like you can have an online shop, you can share photos, you can run competitions, you can have your Twitter feeds, Pinterest boards, you can have all sorts of things that feed into Facebook. So it can be a really nice, um, a nice little hub to link all of your social media. There are now more than 1 billion active users of Facebook around the world. Uh, which is kind of mind-boggling if you think about is there anything else in the world that connects that many people. Um, I know I can't think of anything else that does that. Um, in Australia we have more than a million users and 6.6 .6 million check-in daily. So that's um, quite a significant number. It's about 69% of our internet population and they spend almost nine hours a month on the site. And interestingly enough, the fastest growing user group is females aged 55 to 65. So there's often a misconception that Facebook's just for Gen Y. Gen Y are um, often, they're now leaving Facebook because they've been forced to friend mum and dad from a security perspective. So, um, you know, a lot of younger people are actually finding some of the shorter, faster, sharper social media platforms and Facebook is uh, this 55 to 65 you demographic, I'm sure, is all the uh, baby boomers wanting to see photos of their grandkids. So there we go. So just some of the strategy considerations that um, you want to look at up front. You want to look at what budget will be allocated. And a lot of people say social media is free. Um, now for those smaller stations that are completely run by volunteers, this isn't so important because it will come into your volunteer hours. But to do anything like advertising or develop apps that are really customised to your station, um, you'll definitely need a budget for social media. So it's important to consider that. And for those that have got paid staff, remember that people's time is part of that expense. It's very hard to justify or measure the results of something if you don't attribute a dollar value to it. You want to look at what your response time targets are. So, um, you know, as we talked about last time, social media is not a broadcast mechanism. It's not something where you have all the ability to broadcast like you do on a radio station. It's very much a two-way interaction and people expect a response from brands on Facebook. So if they're taking the time to comment, question, to reach out and connect with you, you really do need to be connecting with them. So set some targets around, is that 24 hours? Is that a manageable time for your station? For some of the larger stations or larger organisations, um, I would suggest that you make that a much shorter response time. And uh, the expectations of the public now are becoming shorter and shorter. Um, I know for the large corporates that dedicate a lot of resource to their social media, they look at between one to two hour response times. Now that's not going to be realistic for a lot of you and particularly where you've got individuals that are managing pages for their own radio program, they may be doing other things outside of that. Um, but really get clear on what your targets are and measure those to make sure that you're uh, fulfilling on your commitment to your listeners. You definitely want to be clear on how you'll engage with complaints or how you'll engage with negative criticism and I've got a slide to talk about that a little later on. Uh, you definitely want a policy and some written guidelines around how you'll engage with trolling, flaming and abuse. And we've seen this particularly uh, 
you know, recently, it happens a lot with radio stations, particularly the commercial ones. Um, but you have an obligation when you're running these Facebook pages, you have an obligation and a responsibility to make it a safe place for people to participate. So you do need to have a policy around how you will um, deal with any trolling, flaming and abuse. For people who are sitting there shaking their heads saying, what is she talking about? Uh, trolling is where you attack people online. Flaming is where it's like a fire, something flames up very quickly and um, a lot of people attack one person and abuse is the traditional definition of abuse. But be really clear about how you're going to engage with that. You want to be clear about how you're going to document that. Um, and again, I've got some guidelines for that a little later on. And you definitely want to have a staff policy, a crisis plan and a communications plan. Now these don't need to be over the top complicated, but a couple of things from a legal perspective with Facebook. Um, the Advertising Standards Board has brought in uh, rulings that say that you as a brand are responsible for your business pages and you're responsible for what happens on those pages. So if people are making false claims, if people are doing anything that's illegal or fraudulent through your page, you're actually responsible. So you need to be aware of what's happening on your pages. And secondly, for those that employ staff, um, if staff act outside the bounds, and again we've seen this with some commercial radio stations where there's some grey areas about how staff are behaving on social media, um, if you don't have a staff policy, you're not able to terminate someone due to their misconduct on social media. So you need to have a really clear, doesn't have to be complex, but a really clear policy to guide your staff. Now in terms of the team that you want to build, you want to select the team or the person in some cases carefully. And some of those considerations are particularly for radio stations, you know, is it the personality, is it the, the show host that is the focus of social media? Is it more of a technical, um, a technical function? So sometimes it, it's put in with IT or, or a digital uh, side of things. Is it a customer service platform? So is it um, the focus more about engaging with your, with your listeners? Or is it about content and marketing? And you want to be clear about um, the skills that the person has and who it is that you're going to put onto these platforms. So just because a person has social media skills doesn't necessarily make them the best voice for your organisation. So I can't tell you, I wish I had a dollar for every time I was in a business or a company and they said, um, or a not-for-profit in particular, and they said, oh, we're going to, you know, we've started social media and it's great, we've given it to our Gen Y work experience person or our receptionist because she's on Facebook all the time, she lives on Facebook. Now those people have got really important skills and I'll talk a little bit later about reverse mentoring and how you can bring those skills uh, to play. But remember that these, are, these platforms are your most public and your most time critical platforms. So you don't want to give responsibility, doesn't mean that people can't do the technical functions, but you don't want to give responsibility of that voice to the person that might not have the most experience or wisdom uh, or capability to deal with things when they go wrong. So it doesn't really matter how small the organisation is, you definitely want to look at it might be that you've got an intern or a student or a volunteer who is developing some of the content and who is posting that content or doing some of the scheduling, but you want to make sure that you've got people with decision-making abilities and people who are good in a crisis who are also involved so that they can keep a check on what's happening. And we'll talk about some of those systems and processes. And as I've already mentioned, you want to have a very clear social media uh, policy. Some of the other things you might want to consider when you're looking at who's going to be involved, you want to have definite training documents with do's and don'ts. So particularly if, you're, um, if you have volunteers managing your social media, resource them. You know, don't set people up to 
to fail. You want to give people really clear information about what's okay on your platforms and what isn't. Um, I mentioned reverse mentoring just a moment ago. One of the things that we set up in a lot of um, companies that we work with is you don't want to discredit the, the um, experience and the technical knowledge that younger people bring to the fore. And so often we will put senior managers with younger staff so that the younger staff really teach them, the older staff, about the culture of social media and etiquette on social media and how it works and why it works. Um, and that younger person also gets mentored in some of the, the things that might be learned over time and with a bit more business wisdom. So reverse mentoring can be a really useful thing to have in your organisation um, to support both uh, the engagement of younger staff or volunteers and also the education of um, management if you have that many layers in, in your station. You want to think about how you're going to scale your team around time specific events. So if you think um, about a social media crisis or a big fundraising event or something that breaks in the news and for whatever reason people take to your page to go and discuss these issues, you want to make sure that you've got the resources. Um, when we do work around crisis planning, it's one of the things if you get to the point where you can't respond to all of the comments and questions because something's got a bit of heat on your social media pages, um, you want to make sure that you've got people who know what they're doing to bring in around that. So sometimes that's just about doing a training session with you know, three or four, five or six, depending on the size of your station, of people who are not involved on a day-to-day -day basis with, with your social media implementation, but who've got the skills that, if necessary, you can bring them in. And it's also good when people are on holidays or it gives people the opportunity to um, to share that responsibility around. Have a look at where they're physically located. For smaller organisations, having someone off-site to manage the social media is absolutely fine. But if you're a larger radio station and you have a lot of engagement or interactivity, maybe being in close proximity to the radio host might be useful. It may actually be the radio host as well, but I would suggest that if somebody's on air um, a bit like I'm doing the webinar at the moment, I've shut down the chat box so I can't see it because it's very hard to speak and be, be across what's happening from a text perspective as well. So think about the physical location of where people sit with social media. And I definitely recommend that you have a review team. Now if you're a smaller organisation and you don't get a lot of engagement, this is less important. But for those that have got more engagement happening, um, you want to have people that, um, that can help you out if things do escalate or go beyond your ability to deal with. Um, and you know, a lot of people are interested in social media. So it might not be part of their day-to-day -day role, but they might be interested in um, being on call if something happens. And if you, I know I've had some times where I've had clients ring at all hours and something's exploded on their social media platforms. Um, and you can't see the wood for the trees sometimes when there's a lot going on. So having somebody else just to check in with and make sure that the responses are, um, are adequate can be really useful. And you definitely want to have a crisis plan for when things go wrong. And the best way to start a crisis plan is to sit down and look at what are the complaints that come through email, telephone, um, or on air and what would you do if that happened on social media. Uh, so do a little bit of scenario planning about if things go wrong, how are you going to deal with that? And that's always the best, um, the, best uh, the best starting point for a crisis plan. See, I just opened the chat box and I lost my train of thought. So, so just checking that, that everyone's still there. Now in terms of building the page, um, I've seen a few questions come in around personal versus business versus groups on Facebook. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the differences. So a personal profile, most of you will have those as users of social media. And this allows you, this is meant to be for an individual. 
and this allows you to friend somebody and that's a two-way interaction. If I want to be your friend, you have to give me permission to be your friend. Um, the reason I don't recommend personal pages for organisations, particularly radio stations, but any brand, um, is that as a consumer or as a listener of your radio station, I don't necessarily want you to have access to my personal details. And when I become a friend of your station on Facebook, I'm in essence giving you access to photos of um, my friends and family, I'm giving you access to my education, my employment history, depending on what level of information I've got on my Facebook page. I don't want to give a brand access to that. So if you currently have a personal profile set up for your uh, radio station, I would highly recommend that you transition to a business page. I take it a step further and I don't even become friends with clients on Facebook. So the first thing that happens when I start to work with um, people on their social media is they want to become a friend on Facebook. And I always very politely say, thank you so much for the friend request. I keep Facebook just for my family and friends. Um, please like the business page and I'm very happy to answer any questions or engage with you about social media through there. And people are generally pretty understanding about that. For example, I found out today that uh, at my 19 week pregnancy scan that I'm having a baby girl and that's now all over Facebook and all of my friends and family are chatting about the fact that we're having a baby girl and I don't particularly need my clients uh, to know that. However, I'm very happy to share it on a webinar with a whole lot of radio stations around the country. Um, it's very hard when you don't hear laughter back, but I'll keep, I'll press on. Uh, so, a <laughs> <day. laughs> Thank you, I feel much better. <laughs> um, a business page. The purpose of a business page is that a brand can have a presence on social media or on Facebook um, where me as a consumer, I can like your page but you don't have access to any of my contact information. Now Facebook are making it harder and harder for business pages to get seen um, and I'm going to talk a bit about what that means and how that works but they ultimately want you to advertise with them which is where they're, particularly since they've become a publicly listed company, they're uh, very interested in your advertising dollars. However, some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight will really help to make sure that your content does get seen. But a business page has the ability, or the timeline for business has the ability to do all of those things I talked about on the first screen. And that's what I'm going to focus more on shortly. Um, groups on Facebook can be open or closed groups. My recommendation, and again, every situation is different, but this is my general broad brush recommendation, is that you don't use groups. The biggest benefit of Facebook is the viral nature, is that your current listeners lead you to more people like them. So they lead you to your next best customer or your next best listener. And groups are very restrictive in terms of um, the viral nature. So the people that witness your interactivity in a group are the people who are members of that group. So it's kind of got a bit of a boundary around it that stops the viral nature. And that's where you get the best marketing benefit and the best relationship building benefit from Facebook is by actually allowing the fact that if I like your content on your Facebook page, then my 300 friends and family see that and they're potential listeners for you. Where closed groups can be really useful, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this tonight because it's a whole different area, but closed groups can be really useful for your things like volunteer management. So if you have a whole lot of volunteers that work with your radio station, my recommendation would be that you know, to, to have them on Facebook and to keep them engaged on Facebook, to have a closed group actually allows you um, the ability to communicate, upload documents, uh, share information, but it's not happening at a public level. 
Um, I'm currently in a group with about 200 other women who are also due in December and that's a very interesting group but for a lot of reasons you can imagine why that people don't want that information shared on their public page. So a closed group can be a really good way to um, have conversations that you don't want to happen on a, on a public stage. It's really worth for a business page asking who is the administrator. Now what tends to happen in most organisations is one very enthusiastic person decides to start a Facebook page and that's how 99% of Facebook pages have started over time is that somebody, um, you know, whether there's approval or not, somebody started a Facebook page. And this can be a really big challenge for organisations because you don't want uh, 20 different people setting up Facebook pages for your brand um, without some kind of continuity and making sure that there's you know, clearly articulated guidelines on how they're going to be run. My recommendation would be that if you already have an account set up, which I imagine most of you do, have a business page set up, the way that it works is you have administrators and you do have to have a personal account to be an administrator on Facebook. There was a time where you didn't have to and so there are some legacy pages that are not attached to people. Um, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that because there will be very few of you that are in that situation. Um, but you can add administrators. So if you are an administrator on the page, you can add other people and you can give those people access levels. So a manager has got the ability to add other administrators, send messages, create posts as the page, create adverts and view the insights. And then you can see those other um, categories there. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see those other categories there. Um, you can have someone who's just able to create content but not able to respond to questions or can just moderate, which means that they can um, block users or uh, engage with users. You can have someone who's just an advertiser, so they've got the ability to set up advertising for the page or someone who can only look at the insights. Now, if you're a small organisation, then don't worry about this, just everyone can be a manager and that's probably the way that you've got it set up. But in most cases what I would suggest is that you set up either if you have a domain for your, um, your radio station, so if it's www.xyz.com.au and you've got emails that are able to go to that domain, you might want to set up a, an email account which is social media at xyz.com.au and I would suggest that you set up a profile a personal profile under that email address that you make an administrator of the page. And it means that as people come and go, there's an account that's actually owned by, um, by the radio station that can delete other administrators. Um, I've worked with many companies where they've had someone leave, a disgruntled employee has left and taken a page with them. And when you put so much work into it, the last thing you want is for someone to have the ability to take that page with them. Having a quick sip of water. So um, I very, very rarely, in fact, I, that's the only circumstance I can think of uh, where I suggest that you breach Facebook's terms and conditions, which is setting up a profile that's a fake profile but it does give you a level of security for your business. Um, and you can have as many administrators as you like. But just remember that the more administrators you have, the harder it is to have continuity. So make sure that anyone that is an administrator on the page, and particularly anyone that's engaging on the page, has got the adequate training or the adequate knowledge to be able to do that. Now, if this is the only thing that you take on board from this evening's webinar, this is the one slide to put your glass of wine down, perk up and, and take note of. Now, Facebook is based on an algorithm called EdgeRank. And EdgeRank is, if you saw the social networking, the movie, uh, or the social network, the movie, it's the algorithm that uh, Mark Zuckerberg wrote on the window in the fog at Harvard. And I'm sure it was much longer than the algorithm that he wrote there.
but no one will ever know, unless you're in the inner sanctum of Facebook, no one will ever know how this really works. But people like me who spend all day, every day on Facebook and use this for marketing and customer service and um, publicity on a regular basis, these are the things that dictate whether your content gets seen or not on Facebook. And it's based on affinity, weight and relevancy. So the things you'll know yourself, when you log into Facebook and you look at your news feed, they're not in chronological order unless you've changed the setting to be that. And you'll notice that often the same people or the same pages will show up um, more so than others. I know I've got friends who I connected with on Facebook, you know, three years ago who I've never commented, liked, shared, done anything to connect with them on Facebook and I never see them on Facebook. Now if you go to their page, you'll see that they post regularly, but I'm not seeing the content because I'm not, I don't have regular connection with them. So the things that show up on people's news feeds are the people and pages that they interact with most. So if you like a business page, you want to go and interact with that page a little bit right off the bat. That will mean that it shows up in your, um, in your news feed. There's also the ability to receive notifications when certain pages show up for you and you can suggest to your listeners that they turn that function on if they want to make sure that they see your content. The people and pages that others have interacted with most so if I like a page and five of my friends also like that page, I'm going to see that far more than a page that only I like that nobody else sees. Um, posts that have a link or a photo, that boosts your edge rank. Now this one, um, different blogs get written on this a lot because sometimes text only posts can actually have a really uh, strong engagement. But it goes, it's kind of common sense. If you think about running your eyes down the news feed, something that's got a big appealing image or that has a link that's got some text and a photo with it, um, you're much more likely to take note of what that is than if it's just text. So you're much better off including a link to a website or a photograph with your posts. Uh, pages that respond to comments and engage with fans, they rank higher with edge rank. So pages that just broadcast and don't actually engage, um, that affects edge rank. And posts that are done manually, so not through a third party software. So for all of you who use Hootsuite or Buffer or other third party software to schedule posts that go to Facebook, I'm really sorry to break it to you. But Facebook in their typical uh, closed universe model um, penalise these posts by up to 70%. So uh, now that Facebook has the ability to schedule posts, you definitely want to go in and schedule any content directly in Facebook and post directly in Facebook. Don't post using a third party piece of software. So that's edge rank, which really, if you do those things, it's quite intuitive. You know, the things that get the most engagement basically are um, the more engagement you can drive on your page, the higher you'll rank and the more you'll be seen by people. So it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now we did cover this content plan last time, but the thing that drives engagement most on Facebook is quality content. So I do want to just go over this a little bit. I'm going to, I won't go through the reactive versus proactive again. Basically some companies have got the, just because of the size of their brand, have the ability to just react to what comes in. They don't have to think much about the kind of content. But for most smaller organisations, you have to be really proactive with your content strategy. You want to break down department silos, so think about the different areas in your station that can contribute. So whether that's different programs, whether that's marketing, whether that's volunteer and member development, whether it's um, fundraising, if you have that element in your station where you're looking for donors and supporters, um, whether it's community 
uh, oriented or so you want to break down the silos that often exist in an organization and make sure you've got really uh, a real variety of content make sure that your content is shareable um, we went into this in a lot more detail last time but things that create an emotive response that's the kind of thing that people share or things that add value to people's life they will share that they're much less likely to share content that's you talking about yourself. You want to have a one in five marketing to value ratio. So if you're promoting your station and your programs, you want to have for every one marketing message, you want to have four or five pieces of content that just add value or drive engagement. Um, as I mentioned, people are much less likely to share your content if it's all about you. In terms of the different uh, content types, I'm going to go into each of these in a bit more detail. I'll talk about the bottom three first. So news, as broadcasters, you have access to news, you already share news, definitely put that on social media. You know, heaven forbid Facebook's going to go into meltdown when the royal baby is born because everybody will be talking about it. But if you are also talking about it, that affects your edge rank. So if you're talking about something that's popular, that's much more likely to be seen. And it's also the kind of news that if you get that early on, um, you want to be the page that breaks news. That's why people will want to follow your page. So if you have the resources and the ability to do that, when you've got breaking news, Facebook's the place to share that, absolutely. Um, so you always want to have news that's timely and relevant. And I definitely suggest that you have a content plan where you've got scheduling. So it might be that every Monday you've got an inspiration post. Every Tuesday you've got a marketing post. Every Wednesday you've got um, a blog about something that's happening in the community. You might have some things that are quite formulaic that you can schedule. But then when timely news happens, you want to post that as well so that it keeps your page fresh and it never looks like you're doing the same thing over and over. Promotions work really well on Facebook. If you can get sponsors or local businesses to donate prizes and run a like competition on Facebook, so you have a special app that says you know they get to enter if they like and answer a 25 words or less, um, it can be a great way to drive engagement and increase your uh, membership base on Facebook. And people love special offers, so you might want to partner with a local business around special offers just for your listeners. You can have coupons and vouchers that they can, if they like your page and the page of the business that's partnering with you, um, that's something that you've got that can really add value to sponsors, particularly given your um, ability to broadcast that via radio. And then there's also marketing posts. So you can really tell the story of your station, volunteers, donors, and obviously your program scheduling. Now I'm going to talk a bit more about these other types of content. So if we're looking for an emotive response, um, inspirational content, inspirational quotes are definitely the most shared content, apart from what Justin Bieber might have had for breakfast, are the most shared content on social media. And a lot of people roll, and sorry, particularly Facebook, and a lot of people roll their eyes and say, yes, but everybody's doing it. Um, categorically across the board, every client that we've ever worked with, they're most engaged with content is inspirational quotes. So this one here is one that we've done for a client recently and it's as simple as, I'll tell you the little cheat around this, particularly for smaller organisations that don't have a, a graphic design department. Uh, we certainly don't have graphic designers on, um, on staff so we outsource that but we do these internally. We've literally set up a PowerPoint slide deck that's um, 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres, so you get the nice tile look, um, which works really well on Facebook timeline. We put an inspirational quote over the top of a beautiful image, and we put the logo of the organisation. Now that post 
might get 300 people sharing it and 100 comments and a whole lot of likes um, compared to if we do a promotional post for the Quest for Life Foundation where we're promoting one of their residential programs, it might get four or five likes, a couple of shares and no comments. Now, whilst that doesn't directly have a business benefit for the Quest for Life Foundation, what it does do is it carries their brand. And if we've got 300 people that share that quote, when you look at the potential reach, you can always see in the insights that every time we do one of these, we might get another 30 or 40 people that like the page. So by sharing something that's meaningful to people, it exposes the brand to a whole lot more people, remembering that your current listeners will lead you to more listeners like them. Comics, it's really easy to go to Google and type in comics about radio stations. You'll find there's a whole lot of them and it's fine. I always choose comics that have got the acknowledgement of who it is within the comic, so it's absolutely fine. Uh, to share comics from Google, providing the references in the image. They get shared a lot. There's a lot of engagement that happens around that. And good news stories. Um, you know, I think as a news agency, as a radio station, um, you've got the opportunity to share some good news too. There's a lot of bad news that gets shared in the media every day. Um, particularly as community radio stations, you've got a great opportunity to share good news stories from your community or from your target demographic if it's not just a geographical location. Um, so having a blog, for example, where you just have a, a community blog post once a week that you share on Facebook can be really um, successful in terms of driving engagement. Um, community building content, we talk about um, Things that, again, this isn't about you, this is about your members. So really ask questions that help build community with no hidden agenda. That top one's probably um, not that relevant to you, but you can come up with all manner of questions. You know, Monday morning artists, how do you take your coffee? And you'll find that you might have 50 or 60 people that'll say, thanks, I'll have it white with one. Now, again, doesn't seem to have much to do with your radio station, but you could say, I'm sitting here about to start broadcasting, drinking my coffee, you know, my long black with two sugars, how do you take yours? Um, what you're doing is you're showing a genuine interest in your community. What's happening at work today? Take a picture and post it. That drives engagement on your page. You get some user-generated content. Now, as radio stations, you're really well placed to drive user-generated content. So to actually get people to engage with you through social media and be really blatant about it. So say, you know, what's happening at work today, take a picture and post it on our Facebook page. Make sure you like the page at the same time so that you keep updated with our latest program schedule or with our latest um, competitions and, and announcements. So really instruct people on the behaviour that you want them to take because that's where you'll get the most uptake and people are lazy. It takes a lot to get a like out of a person. Um, so make it easy for them. You might ask, you know, if you could have dinner with any of our show hosts, who would it be and why? So just think about this community building content. These are the questions that are really about your community. Educational content, help your customers or your listeners understand how you work, who you are, and any complicated concepts. So this, um, I've put here this image of behind the scenes from American Air. They ran a great campaign not that long ago, which was about um, you know things like once your bag goes through the check-in, what happens to your bag? So that when people's luggage gets delayed, um, they have a bit more of an understanding about how that might happen. So you're really well placed to you know open the doors and the windows on your radio station. Tell people why it is that you do what you do. Show them how you do it. You, know, you might take, do a little video of one of your radio hosts um, broadcasting and, and what does the panel look like in, I don't know all the, tech, the terminology, but what does the panel look like in front of them and what happens when a caller dials in? 
Um, so really shine a light on what it is that you do. People love that human side of things and you'll get a lot of engagement from that sort of content as well. You want to take the time to craft your messages so that it's interesting content and it's visually appealing. Make sure that the website is optimised for sharing. So you'll probably know um, or you've probably posted links on Facebook before where an image hasn't showed up and it's just the text. I never share those links. Um, so make sure that your website has got good images. If you're going to do blog posts, put images in the blog posts. People are much more likely to share that content if it displays well on social media. So, and on Facebook in particular. And Facebook have just launched the ability that you can actually change the image. Uh, now if it posts a link and there is no image on the page, you can't upload an image. But where I've got that picture there of the social media business plan, um, it was only last week that or the week before that Facebook launched, there's now a link underneath that says upload image. So if I decided that I didn't like the image that was on that blog post, I could actually upload my own image. And you can edit the headline and the content there when you're posting a link. So take the time to optimise the post so that it looks good on Facebook. People are much more likely to share it. And if you're going to post a URL in the comment section. Once the um, link has populated below and is displaying like the one that's on the screen, delete the link up the top. You don't need to crowd the top. In fact, they say um, about 80 characters is people's tolerance on Facebook. So if you don't capture them there, they're not going to read your post. So you don't want to clutter up the top area. You want to have something nice and succinct. This is a great little campaign, creative campaign that the Ritz-Carlton um, in Amelia Island did. In fact, it was an accidental campaign and I just share this because I think as radio stations you're well placed to do these sort of things. But a, a child left Joshy the bear um, in the hotel room and the family called and said, oh, my son's left Joshy the traveling, you know, Joshy the bear. Um, what are we going to do? And the hotel said, absolutely, we'll send Joshy the bear back to you. But what they did first was they made Joshy the bear a little um, ID badge. They took photos of him in the security room. They took photos of him lounging by the pool. And they posted those on social media and then sent the, the bear back to the family with a bit of a care package from the Ritz-Carlton. Really simple. Doesn't take money. Doesn't take... a huge marketing team to put that together. Really nice, simple idea that um, has got the ability to surprise and delight. So if you can do that on Facebook, if you can do that in your social media, um, it's those little things that end up going viral because you've taken the time to be creative, to think about your audience and to do something for somebody else. And you're really well placed as, as radio stations to do that. In terms of when you post um, and how you post, you definitely want to post regularly. I would say a minimum of once a day. Now this depends on resources. So um, if you don't have the ability to post once a day, then Facebook's probably not going to be particularly useful for you. Um, but you don't want to post too regularly. I look at some pages and there are five or six posts that have been done within a, a one hour period and then nothing for 24 hours. That definitely damages your edge rank. And the life cycle of a post is about three hours. So I think it's about 70% of engagement happens on a post in the first three hours. Um, if you post two posts in the same three hours, you're likely to get 50% of the engagement on each post. So you don't want to cannibalise your own content. So as a general rule, every three to four hours if you've got the resources is great. And with scheduling, you should be able to schedule. So you know some of the little things that work well for our clients they might sit down and do 20 inspirational quotes like the one I showed you before and schedule it every Monday morning for 9 o'clock or whatever time 
matches with their target demographic. Um, and schedule those for the next 20 weeks. And it means you know in your mind that every Monday something's being posted, regardless of what newsworthy or uh, timely content you've got. And then you bolster that. But always make sure that you're not posting directly on top of something that's already been done. Time of day definitely matters. Really think about who your target audience is. If your target audience is, is stay-at-home mums, posting around 3 to 5 p.m. or 3 to 7 p.m. is probably not the best time to post because they're probably looking after kids. Um, if your target market is people who work 9 to 5, the times of days that work really well are 7 till 8.30 in the morning, 12 till 1.30 in the middle of the day, 5 till 7 o'clock at night. So it's when people are on the bus or the train, they're checking Facebook. If your um, target demographic is business people, Facebook's probably not where you're most likely to connect with them. Most businesses don't really tolerate people sitting on Facebook all day, so it's quite challenging to get business content um, airtime. However, if you're someone like my business where I'm resourcing businesses with social media skills, people do or they don't mind checking in on my Facebook page outside of business hours because it's stuff that really adds value to them. And make sure that there's a variety of content. You know, there's a bit of a temptation, <coughs> excuse me, there's a bit of a temptation to do an inspirational quote and it gets really good engagement. You go, great, we're going to do one of those every three hours and just schedule them for the next month. And you'll find that that doesn't last very long. So something can go viral one day and then completely tank the next day. So variety is absolutely the key. And it's a little bit like alchemy. You want to, you know, it's a pinch of this and a dash of that. Um, test and and see what works. And if you go into the insights, there's a wealth of information there about reach and virality and uh, what it is that um, is working well for you content-wise. I'm really aware that we're right near the end and we haven't stopped the questions. This is our last slide, but I do just want to say, because I know it was a question that came up for a few people, um, dealing with negative criticism, um, you want to deal with it straight away. What a lot of consumers are doing now is they'll post something at 6 o'clock on a Friday night and the social media team at the business doesn't check it until 9 o'clock on the Monday morning. Um, a lot can happen overnight, a lot can happen over a weekend if things are not being checked. Now for a smaller organisation you're much less likely to have flare-ups. But if there is negative criticism or something erupts on social media, you want to deal with it straight away. If you do the wrong thing, you want to take responsibility. So if people are really unhappy about comments that have been made, you want to take responsibility. And we see this every day in the media, people having to own up. But make it genuine and make it authentic because there's nothing worse than a false apology. Um, and people see straight through it. If there's negative feedback or something erupts on social media, always take a screen capture straight away because the the person that started the debate or the argument or the criticism can delete the comments at any time. And a lot of social media disasters happen because someone posts something that's politically incorrect or um, is quite damaging and then someone takes a screenshot of it and it goes viral and you as a brand can take things down but if someone else has got a screenshot, the damage has already been done. And it's vice versa. If people are attacking you or your station or something's erupting, you want to have a record of it because they've got the ability to delete their own content. Ultimately, though, if you've built a strong, satisfied community, they will defend you in times of uh, crisis or when people are unhappy with you. Um, but you always want to be genuine and authentic. So there's a lot in there and I'm sure that we have got a lot of questions. Um, if there is anything we don't get to tonight, I'm always happy to answer questions um, on our social media and uh, we'll ha we had a look last time at all the questions that didn't get answered. So we'll make sure that we do that. But Nicola. 
What yeah, Kate. Yeah, Kate. Um, I might just, um, I might take, just take that last take question that, that last Laurie put up in the chat window. In the chat window. How can our business pay, can our business pay like, our like our associates' members, members non-profit community groups, non community groups, no longer possible? So I think he's asking how can a page like another page? A page can definitely like another page. So you just um, go in as that business page, so make sure that you're using Facebook as the page, um, and then go to search for the page that you want to like and click like. Okay, a page, okay. Can't, a page like can't like or be friends, or with, be anyone friends though, with anyone can it? though, can it? That is correct. Okay. So the reason okay. for that is that to be friends with a person means that person is giving over their private information and their timeline and people don't want to do that with a brand. I won't like it. I won't become friends with a brand on Facebook um, because it means they've got access to all of my information. Okay. Okay. I'm aware of the fact that I'm I've got a lot of echo. Lot of echo. I'm not sure why it's I'm happening sure why other than is Stephen's audio, audio on. on. Um, no. I have got no echo from you at my end, so no, if it's, it's only not. Steve that can hear your echo, it might be because you're in close. No, it's not. Other people, Other people can hear it. It's, it seems to be a problem with mine. Um, I'll keep going though because as an ex-news reader, I can read over anything. Um, John Langer asks, say we put something like a story about wind energy on Facebook and people comment like, yes, this should be happening quickly. Here, here's the questions. I'm going to hand it to Stephen because of the problem with my audio. Apparently people can't hear it. Sure. He is coming. I can't hear Stephen. Is okay, Stephen. okay. Any better? Any better? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, could everyone okay, quickly just uh, uh, click a message into, into the chat room? Chat room? So yes, if so yes, they can, yes, can hear me. Can hear. The only other thing I can suggest, because people are saying there's still an echo, is if everyone stops typing in the chat, um, Nicola, if you want to cut and paste the questions into the chat, I can read them and then answer them. I, look, one of the problems may be, look, Kate, the problems may be Kate, your, your mic. So if you mic. cut your mic cut and then turn it back on to answer it. To answer it. Done. How are we going now? Everyone better? Okay, I'll start. Um, Joy Taylor has asked, and I think this is a fairly common question, how about presenters who are using their personal pages for promoting their program? Would you recommend they set up a program page or is it preferable to post on the station Facebook? This is a really tricky one because there's a lot of layers to that question and there, is, there isn't really a one-size-fits-all. Um, some individuals that are personalities, um, the best way for them to manage it, if they've got a really large following and people are following because it's the person, you can do one of two things. They can either close down their personal settings um, so that what they're publishing about the radio station is public but everything else that they're publishing is private and then people who are following that person rather than friending that person um, can see those updates. I think that there are some pretty big uh, due diligence and reputational issues with individual people being friends with listeners. Um, that could be a whole kind of session on its own, but if that person posts something that is offensive or um, not something that you want to represent your radio station, you've got very little control to do anything about that if it's on their personal page. So either you need really strict guidelines around how they manage their personal page, but my recommendation would be that you set them up as a public profile. So you can set up a business page 
and it's a personality and that can either be a person or it can be a radio program. Um, the problem with doing it as a person is that if that person moves on from your station, they take that page and all of those followers with them. Um, if you have it as a program, then you retain that page, but people are much more likely to connect with a personality than they are with a brand. So that's why it's not really an easy answer. There's a whole lot of dimensions to that question and you really need to figure out what's best for your radio station. But at the very least, um, if they're posting things on a personal page, you want to be able to, well, you want to ask them to post it on the, the station page as well so that you get the ability to build a bit of a following so that it's not just the person that gets the following. Okay, we'll meet okay, you again. Uh, there's been a couple of questions about frequency of posting, but they were asked prior to Kate doing that bit, so I'll skip them. I'm going to um, go to this question from Glenn Dinsdale, who asks, on the topic of edge rank, what about posts you share from other sources, pages, or peoples? How does that fit into the algorithm? I suppose the question there is, uh, should you be, is it a good idea to uh, share posts from other pages? Back to you, Kate. Um, sharing posts doesn't affect Back your... You, yep, I've unmuted that, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, sharing other people's content doesn't affect edge rank so much, but it is really good from a relationship building perspective. So you don't... I see some pages that all they do is share other people's content, um, and that doesn't do a whole lot for them. I kind of question why you would have a page that only shares other people's. But um, sharing content that's really widely shared can certainly boost engagement. So it's more about whether people like and share the post from your page. Um, that does affect your edge rank, but it, the benefit really is more about the, the relationship that you build because you're promoting somebody else on your page. Okay, another question that I'll jump to from here, because it's related to sharing, is um, the station has their Facebook, pa Facebook page and Twitter account linked. So whenever a post goes on Facebook, it also posts to Twitter. Well, a lot of the time the message is truncate, truncated because it's longer than the character requirements on Twitter. Rather than linking Facebook and Twitter automatically, is it better to post those streams separately? Absolutely. Um, Twitter and Facebook have got really different audiences and really different, really different tones to, um, to the messaging. And as you've already highlighted in the question, there's a structural difference. So the only time I suggest automatically posting Facebook to Twitter is if you're so resource strapped that you can't possibly do two individual pieces of content. However, the preference would be that you recraft your content for Twitter so that it's short, it's punchy, it's sharp, it's got hashtags and it's much more likely to be retweeted and shared than, if, than a truncated um, message. And the Twitterati, the uh, people who love Twitter and hate Facebook, um, hate nothing more than seeing something that they're interested in and having to click through and log into Facebook to go and see what it is that you're saying. So unless resources are so tight that you can't possibly manage two different platforms, um, definitely don't link them. Okay, this is a content-driven question. Uh, we've got, uh, we're a youth station primarily dealing with an audience uh, 13 to the 30. Uh, would you recommend we look at posting things like memes, celebrity gossip and new music to keep things uplifting? There's also been a couple of questions about actually posting music videos from YouTube onto Facebook pages. Uh, has this been seen as a, as a successful idea or is, um, you know, what's your opinion on that? Uh, the first part of the question, you absolutely want to be posting content that's relevant to your target demographic and yes, younger people love memes, love celebrity gossip, love the latest trends, and you want to be seen as the go-to place for them. So think bigger than your radio station and think about what information um, makes you relevant to young people. And um, 
you know, the majority of that content won't be about you, it will be about them. If there's anything that is proven on um, Gen Y engagement with social media is they love it to be all about them. So make sure that you're really focused on, and, and ask them, you know, they're very vocal, they will tell you uh, what it is that they want from you. So find ways to ask and actually get that feedback. Um, the second part of the question was, I'm going to need to be reminded on it. To do with you posting music videos from YouTube. Oh, music videos, yes. Absolutely. As one piece of content variety, videos from YouTube do really well on Facebook. If you've got unique video content, you can upload that directly to Facebook. Um, but absolutely linking to um, absolutely linking to YouTube is a one good stream of content. I can just see, I'm going to answer this question because it's one, um, Stephen, it's just come in saying re-buying likes on Facebook, do you recommend it? Amanda, I'm just going to answer that question really quickly, no, no, no and no. If you buy likes on Facebook, 90% of them are fake profiles, it will damage your edge rank, you will never recover from it. Um, the only way to make Facebook work for smaller organisations or medium organisations is um, to organically grow your audience and it's really tempting to buy a Facebook page, uh, Facebook likes, but it will not do you any good at all and there's no point in having 700 people in uh, India on your Facebook page given that they probably can't get access to your radio station. Go for it. Okay, Kate, this is me. Um, I just want to pick up on a question that came through and it was um, an interesting one from Dylan Finch. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, he asks, what about sharing content from show pages to the main stage station page? So if a station has a station page and then programs have their own pages, what are the relationships between them? Um, Again, it's going to be different for uh, each situation because if you've got, if you predominantly use a main page, look, the, the short answer to that is the more pages you have, the more challenging it is to manage and you miss out on really big opportunities. So my, um, if you've got 10 pages with 100 people on each page because you've got one for each of your shows, those 100 people only get information about that show, but they might actually be interested in another show that you have. So you miss the opportunity to, um, you know, in a commercial sense we talk about cross-selling or upselling. you miss the opportunity of exposing people to more content and you're much better off aggregating content um, from all of your shows in one place because then you'll get a thousand people engaging in that content rather than a um, hundred on each of the individual pages. Now I'm not suggesting that tomorrow morning you go and shut down nine pages because that isn't the way to go either. Um, but you, there wouldn't be a huge amount of value in having one page that you only share the content of the other individual pages. I'd be looking at how you can shut down some of the pages that are maybe not as successful and really drive traffic to your main page rather than to a whole lot of different pages. Having said that, if you have a radio show that is just for 13 to 17 year olds and then you've got the gardening show which is aimed at 60 plus, there, there is some value if you have a large enough user base in having individual communities for them. But if you've only got a hundred in each of those, you're not going to get a huge amount of value. And the 60 year old gardeners might have grandkids that might be interested in the other show. So um, only about 17% of people are seeing your content at any one time. Um, so don't feel like by having lots of your programs on the one place that you're going to be bombarding people. I just wouldn't be posting more than once every three hours. That's the best I can do with such a complex question. Okay, um, I can see that Barry Altman has put a comment up or a question, but I think it's more of a comment really. Facebook is a calendar of events for venues that are showing live shows that are relevant 
to your program. I mean, I think that's what Kate was saying in terms of not talking about ourselves, but talking about um, our audience. Um, if you want to clarify that, to perhaps, um, Kate? Yep, absolutely. That's a great idea. And probably what I'd suggest with that is that you set up a tab or an app on your Facebook page, which is a calendar of events. And then rather than talking about each one individually, you can do a post that says, have you looked at our calendar of events this week? Here are some of the things that we're promoting. And it means that it's, it's kind of like a mini website in there that they can go and have a look at the calendar of events. But otherwise, promoting one-off events that are happening in the community absolutely is adding value to your community. I think we're beginning to wrap up, but I've just seen a big question from 3CR. I often post links to podcasts, but that doesn't come up with an image, so it isn't very eye-catching. Do you have any suggestions about how to grab people's attention with podcasts? Is it better to post the web page that hosts that podcast rather than the MP3 link itself? I guess can I just add to I that, can Kate? I just add to that, Kate? Sure. I think it also points to this idea that should we put audio content directly on Facebook or is the idea that we're driving them back to our website where that audio sits? That's exactly what I would have said, Nicola, is that there is a whole lot more value in you doing podcasts as individual pages on your website with an image that relates to it, with a bit of a text summary about what it is. So the ABC do this really well. Um, you know, each individual podcast is on its own page, has an image, has a description. It means when you post that link, people are clicking and going through to your website, which is ultimately what you want to do, is you want to drive traffic back to you and get them off Facebook if you can. Um, but you need to have the image and you need to have the text description to go with that so that it displays well and then people are much more likely to share that content. Okay. All right, well, we're now approaching 7.15, so I think we're going to have to wrap it up. But we have captured a lot of the questions that have been coming through, so we will do a bit of a blog post to address those. Um, there is a resource that we uh, developed in conjunction with Kate uh, earlier in the year on the CB Online website. If you go to cbonline.org.au slash resources slash, I think, social media, I'll post the link in the chat room. Uh, some of the questions that are being asked there are actually addressed on that resource, so it's a really good starting point. So if you want to go to that and trawl through that and see what's there, in the next week or so we'll post a blog post up addressing some of the questions. For example, there's one here saying, you know, what social media platforms should we be on? There's now about 150. What are some of the more popular sites? That's, uh, you know, something that we can definitely delve into a little bit more, but it's a little bit off topic on this Facebook conversation. So check out what's on cbonline.org.au. Whilst I've got you here, I'd also encourage you all to sign up. If you're not on the CBAA email list, go to the CBAA homepage, cbaa.org.au. Sign up now so you can keep abreast of what's uh, happening in general in the sector and also what's happening with podcasts and possibly even offers on um, some specialist social media training that Kate's prepared to make for stations as well. Um, the next podcast, uh, next podcast, sorry, the next webinar that we're planning on doing is uh, focusing on content development grants. So please spread the word amongst uh, people that you know at a station level who are interested in putting in successful content development grants. We'll have people from the CBAA, uh, sorry, from the CBF, the Community Broadcasting Foundation, joining us for that with some tips and guidelines on how to make, how to uh, put in applications. So we're planning that one for August 14th. So I think we're going to say, uh, Good evening to you all. Everyone, uh, uh, put your hand up or clap the hand thing to say thank you to Kate for um, for the session. And we will send a link out soon to uh, the recording of both the first social media webinar and this webinar. You'll also get another little email link asking you to do a quick Q and A, so we can work on making these things better uh, for the participants in the future. So thanks again for your time. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, Kate. Take care.
I will now stop the recording and not touch anything until it's finished saving.